Welcome to the Gleams, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays Historic Preservation Site here in Greenwood, South Carolina. My name is Chris Thomas and I'm the director of the site. And uh, here on site we have the birth home of Dr. Mays. Dr. Mays was born in that house August 1st of 1894. He was born to two parents that were both ex-slaves. We also have uh, the Burn Springs School here to a school called the Brick House School from age 5 until age 15. But that school is identical and it is one of the four schools uh, along with the Brick House School that was built by Dr. Mays' childhood pastor, Reverend James Foster Marshall. We have uh, this building here that looks like an old barn, but it is actually a modern museum. And inside there we have a history of Dr. Mays' life, a pictorial history on the walls uh, from birth to transition uh, with uh, over 100 photographs in there and, and artifacts of Dr. Mays' life. And we have this statue. It is the most recent addition to our site. Uh, that statue was unveiled uh, in November of 2017. Dr. May said that he was born into respectable poverty. And what he meant by that, uh, he says that in his smaller autobiography, uh, Lord, the people have driven me on. And he said that even though he was born poor, he said all of his lessons he learned in life about honesty, hard work, and integrity, he worked what he learned from the poor sharecropping people of the Epworth community where he was born. He says uh, he was the youngest of eight children. Uh, there were five boys and, and three girls. And uh, he said that uh, he, his mother was a very religious lady and she would call the children into a room at night and pray for them. And he said, Mama, pray for me the most because I was the baby. This first room here would have been the room that Dr. Mays' parents would have, this would have been their, his parents' bedroom. Dr. Mays probably was born in this bedroom. Um, typically, the, in those days, children were born in a home, they were born in their parents' bedroom, and this is probably the room that Dr. Mays was born in. He says that uh, he, he and his sisters and he, his mother and father and his sisters shared a room, and him and his brothers in shared room. Dr. Mays only lived in this house, though, until he was about five years of age, uh, maybe close to six, and after that, he moved to another house that was about two and a half miles away from this house, and it was at the other house that Dr. May spent most of his time going to the Brick House School uh, and learning from age five until age 15. We have him standing in front of this house uh, in the early 1970s, and he tells us about that story, and he says that it was about seven miles round trip from his new house to the Brick House School where he would walk, and that house was about two and a half miles from this home. Here on site, we keep a living history as well. Uh, right now, it's not as pretty as it'll be in the six or eight weeks, but uh, we have a, a garden that we grow cotton, uh, means to be corn and okra and, and snap peas and tomatoes. Uh, and we also have a cotton field every year. And uh, we, we grow these to give young people, particularly that come to the site, an idea of what Dr. Mays' childhood was like. Uh, Dr. Mays said in his autobiography concerning corn, he said that even when he was an older man, he said he still loved to see the sight of corn blowing in the wind. Uh, Dr. Mays was also a very proud field hand. Dr. Mays wasn't offended by his life on the farm. He just said he wanted something more out of life. Uh, but we try to keep that uh, cotton field as an example of what Dr. Mays did from age five until he leaves the farm at age, age 18. Uh, Dr. Mays uh, worked as a farmhand uh, all year long and almost because uh, that because of that, uh, the only time of year that he's able to go to school is November, December, January, and February. So until Dr. Mays uh, is 20 years of age, he only goes to school four months a year. This is the Burn Spring School. Uh, it is identical to the Brick House School that Dr. Mays attended. Uh, Dr. Mays was born into a world that uh, gave him the idea that his life ambition should be to be a tenant farmer. And Dr. Mays rejected that very early in life. And uh, he didn't really know what he wanted to do, but he knew that he wanted to get an education. And this will give you an idea uh, by being in this room of what Dr. Mays' childhood school environment was like. Inside the museum, we tell a history of Dr. Mays' life from birth. Uh, this is period here, it's from his period here in the Epworth community, from his birth in 1894 to 1911. Uh, these are his family members that we have photographs of. Uh, that's actually the picture on the bottom there is his sister Susie uh, standing out in front of the actual brick house school that Dr. Mays attended. As you can see, it was identical to the building that we were just in. Dr. Mays leaves the farm at uh, 18 years of age, and he wants to go to high school. And Dr. Mays ends up going down to South Carolina State, down in Orangeburg, and uh, he goes to high school at South Carolina State. And those are the pictures on top there. Dr. Mays had a childhood dream that he wanted to go somewhere up north, and he wanted to compete with the minds of these Yankees that he heard so much about. And so uh, Dr. Mays has an opportunity by his second year of college, his first year, he goes to Virginia Union. And this was after he graduated valedictorian of his class uh, 
from South Carolina State High School Department, which is quite amazing considering when Dr. Mays was 18 years of age when he gets there, uh, he takes tests to determine what grade he's ready to enter. And at 18 years of age, Dr. Mays is only ready to enter the eighth grade. So he's the age that kids finish high school, and at the time he was only ready to enter the eighth grade. And uh, very impressive considering he's one of the great minds of the 20th century. But Dr. Mays has to go to Virginia Union his first year, and uh, he only goes there for one year, and he gets an opportunity to do what he desired to do, and that was to go up north. And so for his sophomore, junior, and senior year, he goes to Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. Uh, Dr. Mays uh, said it was very different than the uh, segregated racial South that he was accustomed to. In fact, he said that he was living in a predominantly white world at the Bates College. He said, but for the first time in his life, he was treated as an individual respected for who he was. And so these pictures here detail Dr. Mays' time at Bates College. This next period here from 1920 to 1940s, uh, we see on top there Dr. Mays' two wives. Uh, Ellen Harbour was his first wife. Um, Ellen, unfortunately, would die about uh, four years after Dr. Mays, and uh, Ellen married. At this time, Dr. Mays is a teacher at uh, Morehouse College, and uh, Dr. Mays comes there in the fall of 1921 to begin to uh, teach there on campus, and uh, Ellen had uh, gone to high school with him, and uh, they were high school sweethearts. They dated all through high school. They went to separate colleges, and for four years, they wrote each other a letter every single day. Uh, after she passes away, uh, Dr. Mays would leave Morehouse uh, during his first teaching stint from 1921 to the latter part of 1923. And uh, he would then go back to the University of Chicago where he briefly started to work on a master's degree. And when he finishes his master's degree in 1924, he comes uh, in the fall of 1925 to where he went to high school at, at South Carolina State College. And he teaches there for one year. And he meets that young lady there, Sadie Gray. She was on staff in the spring of 26, uh, the two of them married. Dr. Mays would later go back to the University of Chicago and get a PhD. And that picture there is Dr. Mays in his robe, earning his PhD in 1935 from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Mays was a great religious scholar, uh, as well as going on to be a tremendous college president. After he earns that degree, he comes in 1934, in fall of 34, and he becomes the dean of the School of Religion at Howard University. And uh, Dr. Mays really begins to uh, distinguish himself as a skilled college administrator uh, and, and a skilled uh, uh, scholar while he was there. And uh, also during this time, Dr. Mays becomes a tremendous international leader. Uh, he travels the world. Uh, he goes on these YMCA conferences. And the most notable of those in 1936, uh, he goes to a conference in Lasore, India, and has an opportunity to have a 90 minute meeting with Mahatma Gandhi. And this picture on the bottom there is Gandhi. And that's him and two other ladies on the Queen Mary uh, on, on, en route to Lasore, India to go to that conference. Uh, he stays the dean of the School of Religion at Howard University from 1934 uh, to 1940. And in 1940, he gets a call from Morehouse to become its sixth president. And Dr. Mays comes to Morehouse College in the fall of 1940. Uh, of course, it became a difficult time because the following year, World War II breaks out. He loses a great number of his students. Uh, and Dr. Mays has to uh, go about the business of raising money. Uh, some of the interesting stories of Dr. Mays' life. Uh, is through some of the people that he encountered during that time. Margaret Mitchell, uh, of course, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller, we see him pictured with Rockefeller and his wife, and uh, Francis Carlos Spellman in that photograph up there. And, uh, but Dr. Mays, during this time, uh, when he's replacing these students, he gets some money from the Ford Foundation to start an early admissions program that they were going to bring college students to Morehouse early in hopes that uh, in case they got drafted at 18, by the time they were drafted, they would already have their college degree. And so in the, in the fall of 1944 was the first group of these early admission students. And as you see there on top, uh, one of the young men who was in that class was a young 15-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. Mays would become King's mentor and would really help to transform and to shape Dr. King into the preacher that he would become and the fierce fighter against what Dr. Mays had always hoped to battle against, and that was Southern segregation. Uh, Dr. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, said that it was under the leadership of a spiritual father, Dr. Martin, Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, the president of Morehouse College, that Martin received his call to the ministry. She said that Dr. Mays took an interest in Martin from the first to the last and ultimately set his life on the course that he would take and what she meant by that was the ministry. Uh, Dr. Mays had a, had a profound influence on the greatest civil rights leader that our country knew. He learned to transform society by raising up uh, three decades of leaders, well, nearly three decades. He was there for 27 years. Uh, and uh, Dr. Rome Bennett said that Dr. Mays had a 30-year ministry of manhood. 
uh, and he shaped and formed more uh, black male leaders than anybody in the history of this country. Uh, he, re he retires from his position there in 1967. He takes a year off, uh, and in that year, unfortunately, uh, that year is marked by tragedy in his life. Uh, in 1968, he loses his spiritual son, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. These pictures here are from Dr. Mays. He was called upon to, to eulogize Dr. King, and those photographs are the one on top is him and Ralph Abernathy, the great civil rights leader, uh, and they're walking behind that picture in the middle, which is the casket of Dr. King. And the picture on the bottom there, and we just had the 52nd anniversary of Dr. Mays preaching the eulogy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he was fantastic that day, and he closed that sermon by saying what Martin Luther King Jr. believed, and that was if physical death was the price he had to pay to rid America of prejudice and, prejudice and injustice, uh, Dr. King said nothing could be more redemptive, and uh, Dr. Mays was fantastic that day. Uh, his next public opportunity to serve in America was he becomes the, uh, the following year, he takes a position on the Atlanta Public School Board. About six months after receiving uh, a position on the school board, he was encouraged by the other school board members to become the president of the Atlanta Public Schools. Uh, and he does that almost up until his death. Uh, he uh, stays the president of the Atlanta Public Schools. He led them through the desegregation process, and uh, he really did this through committees. Uh, it was very impressive how he did it. And uh, they're one of the only major metropolitan cities that did not have to have the National Guard come, called in to desegregate the public schools. And uh, William Forston, who was the attorney for the school district at the time, said that the reason they did, did not have any violence is because uh, Dr. Mays had earned so much respect from people on both sides of the aisle. And what he meant by that was the racially segregated Atlanta at the time, that he said no one wanted to cause Dr. Mays any uh, disrespect or any embarrassment. So everyone sort of fell in line and followed his leadership. Uh, but uh, Dr. he stayed in that position for quite some time. Dr. Mays would become an advisor to three presidents, to John Fitzgerald Kennedy, to uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and the last one would be Jimmy Carter. Uh, and these pictures here are from Dr. Mays, uh, and he becomes a part of Carter's Educational Council, and that's them signing an education bill in 1979. This photograph here is the last photograph we know. It was taken of Dr. Mays in public life. He is staring out the back office of uh, the back door of his office at the Atlanta Public School, and that is just several minutes before he walked out of public life into retirement. Uh, and so uh, it's just one of the photographs that we have here. In this room here, we have many artifacts of Dr. Mays' life. This is his PhD robe from earning his PhD from the University of Chicago. This dining room set was his dining room set from his home, the presidential home on Morehouse's campus. Uh, for 27 years. That trunk in the back of the room there is the trunk that he took around the world when he went and he uh, traveled the world and went to Germany and China and Japan and India uh, in the 1930s. The chair on the left uh, is his graduation chair from Bates College. <coughs> Above that chair is Dr. Mays' favorite top coat. The chair on the right was actually his favorite rocking chair from his home in Atlanta. The china in the cabinet here was his wife's china. And we know from a picture in there that, of course, the Carters uh, ate in Dr. Mays' home. On the wall here is a list of Dr. Mays' honorary doctor degrees. For years, he had more than any other American. Uh, he had 56 honorary doctor degrees, and he had four earned degrees, including his high school diploma, and then three uh, earned college degrees, and uh, it is an impressive list, uh, primarily because uh, for a man that spent the most of his life working in historically black college and universities, uh, many of these degrees, uh, honorary degrees, were not given to him by historically black colleges. The one that he said he was the most proud of was the one that he earned from Lambert University here in our hometown of Greenwood, South Carolina. Uh, Dr. Mays was honored by that because he said that the school that was in his hometown, they would have never even allowed him to have admission to the college was now honoring him with their highest degree. And Dr. Mays felt in some way that that was kind of a culmination of his life that proved that all of his labors had not really been in vain, that even the Greenwood of his birth, that uh, he was introduced to so much racial violence very early on, uh, now he felt like that, that had clearly a change that they would all, you know, give him an honorary doctorate degree. 
So thank you for coming and touring the uh, Benjamin the Gleans, Dr. Benjamin Humane's Historical Preservation Site. Uh, we encourage you to come and visit. This is just a snippet of what the tour would be like. There's so much more to Dr. Mays' life that we would share with you when you're here. And we encourage you to come and visit here in Greenwood, South Carolina.